Hi everyone, it's me, Tim, and today I want to talk about all the different design specifications that a single game may need. Because about a month ago, I gave an example of how to write a design specification, and Gypsum Generation asks, what are all the design specifications that a game might need? Okay, that is a very long answer. So grab your coffee. Also, I'm going to put a big caveat on this and say the answer really depends on the game you're making because different games will have different sections in their design specification. So let's pretend we're making a fantasy RPG and I will tell you what the design specs should include. So I'll break it down into, I'll go down to what all the main sections of the design specification are. And then for each one of those sections, I'll talk about subsections that they should have. Why don't you take a look at my writing design specifications for exactly the kind of details you will have to put in each one of those subsections. So let's start with the setting. Remember, a long time ago I said, whenever you put together a new game, you should do setting and then story and then system mechanics. So the setting should basically describe the world that everything is set in, what the major areas in it that will be covered in the game, because you may have a big world, but you're only gonna cover this section of it. You wanna talk about the history of the whole world and especially detailed history in that section you're going to have your game in. And then talk about what kind of people are in this world, what kind of you know animals, what kind of monsters, so you can lay the groundwork for here's what's gonna appear in the game. The next thing after setting is story. The story basically consists of the main acts you're gonna go through. I think I mentioned in Fallout there were only three acts. It was um, find the water chip, stop the mutants, and stop the master. Arcanum, conversely, had 27 acts, <laughs> so it was a lot more complicated. I believe the correct number of acts lies somewhere in between those two. Both of those were a little extreme. Your story should also detail all of the key characters. These will be the characters that move your story along. They'll probably give most of the main story quests. In some games, you may mark them as essential, that they can't be killed. In my games, what this means is these key characters, you have to come up with how the story will progress if the player decides to kill them. Whether it's a secondary NPC steps up to the plate, or you find their journal, or on them is some thing that leads you on to the next stage of the quest, something like that. But you should mark out what your key story characters are in your story section. Then this brings you to the system mechanics. There are a ton of sections that you would have to cover on this, each one with a ton of subsections. I'm not even gonna begin to detail the subsections, but I will tell you what they are. So let's start with the character system mechanics. These are things like attributes, skills, spells, perks, traits, backgrounds, races, flaws. Now you may not have all of these, but you'll probably have a good chunk of them. And you have to describe in each one of those subsections, you have to describe what these things are, how they're obtained, how they can be raised during, raised up during the game, you know, what the ranges are, what, what you're expected to do when the character goes up a level and whether, of course, whether or not they can be respect. This leads you into a description of character creation from a mechanical point of view. Remember, when I when I talked about inventory the other day, I said you have to do the system mechanics and the user interface separately. Same thing for character creation. So you talk about this is what gets selected by the player at character creation. You talk about whether they're given points to spend or whether they do rolls, whether they can re-roll, things like that. Then you talk about exactly the mechanics of leveling up. Every time the player gains a level, what happens? Then you talk about all the status effects that can exist in the game. Maybe these status effects come from perks or skills or backgrounds. Maybe they come from spells. Maybe they come from items when they're equipped. 
Maybe they come during combat. Maybe they come from hazards in the environment. But these are things like poison, slowed, frozen, electrified, prone, knocked down, knocked out. There could easily be three, four, five dozen of these. I've worked on games that had over 100 status effects. You are going to have a lot. Status effects are maintained usually by a module that keeps track of how long they last, what applied them, how long they last, how they interact with other status effects, that kind of thing. And you will have to describe those in excruciating detail in a status effects section. And then I think the last major um, section here would be inventory, where you talk about how encumbrance works, what different equipment slots exist on uh, the player and maybe NPCs, which leads you into combat. Combat is a big section, tons of subsections. You want to basically talk about what kind of combat you have at a high level, what kind of mode you operate in. Is it real time? Is it real time with pause? Is it turn based? Then you talk about how skills work in combat, what the rules are for hitting, for missing, for critical hitting, for critical missing, if you have any of those things, how weapons work, melee versus ranged, projectile or hit scan, talk about the magic versions that exist of these. You have to go in very in, in excruciating detail. Now, I gave an example for my design specification of how you'd make one weapon. You're going to have a ton of those in this section. Very, very similar to that, you're going to have a lot of armor described. What slots they go into, because sometimes you have tons of armor slots. You have a helm and face and torso and arms and legs and hands and feet. And then you're going to have to talk about what magical versions exist for this. Keep in mind, you'll probably be going back and adding things into the status effects section as you invent new magical versions of armor and weapons. Finally, you talk about creatures. What kind of creatures exist in the world? Animals, monsters, any kind of NPC that you run into. What kind of abilities they have? What kind of attacks they do? This may add even more status effects into your status effects section. Then... Another major section in system mechanics is dialogue. You're explaining exactly how dialogue works, how you want it to branch, any restrictions you have. We, like on many of my games, there was no more than five nodes in any one, uh, no more than five lines in any one dialogue node could ever be displayed at the same time. So if you had conditions, so you had more than one line, you had to make sure that none of those, no more than five of those lines ever could have their conditions be true. Talk about how skills work in dialogue. Talk about how NPC reaction works in dialogue, how dialogues affects NPC reaction and how NPC reaction affects dialogues. Then that gets you into the stealth section. Keep in mind, see I'm going combat, dialogue, stealth. If those are super important, they should all have their own section. Stealth will describe how hiding works in general, if it interacts with lighting and cover, excruciating, you know, how NPCs detect them. You want to talk about locks, what kind of difficulties they are, how it interacts with whatever skills and perks you have. You want to talk about what kind of paths you want made that are stealth for quests that include tunnels and vents and hacking into computers and you know uh, picking open cabinets that would have files in them, all kinds of stuff like that. You, you will need detailed descriptions of how NPCs detect the player doing all of things all these things, hiding, picking locks, hacking computers, and what happens when that happens? What is the reaction of the NPC to finding the player doing these things? If you're going to have companions, you're going to have to have a whole section on them detailing exactly how companions work, including where the player will get them. Each one is probably different. When they show up in the main story arc, you probably don't want you know somebody showing up in the 19th chapter of your 20-act story arc how to keep NPC uh, companions. Can they leave? Can they decide to leave? How many companions exist in the game? How many can you have at the same time? Is it dependent on an attribute or a perk or a skill? You want to talk about bonuses and penalties related to companions? Maybe some companions give you a bonus when they're in the party. Maybe some give you a restriction, like you're not allowed to kill good people when this companion's around. Things like that. Also, you want to talk about the companions and how they not only fit into the main storyline, because they'll have reactions to it as you go along, but you also want to talk about whatever storylines the companions have on their own, because often 
when you get a companion, they have their own set of quests that they want you to do, and that tells a story about problems the companions has and how he wants help from the player to resolve them. You want an entire section on economy, which includes loot and loot tables and how it's distributed among different NPCs and in encounters. You want to talk about vendors and how they get loot. You probably want to throw a section in here about crafting and how that would work and where the materials come from and what things can be crafted because that's a really big effect on economy. You want to talk about the areas in the game. Remember, you mentioned them in the earlier section on the setting. Here's where you go into excruciating detail about how big they are, cities, towns, dungeons, castles, what NPCs are there, what encounters are preset, that they're always there, and then random encounters that you can have. Maybe it's random in the dungeons. Maybe it's random in the wilderness. This is where you define it. And then finally, you're going to go through user experience which you can break up into three subsections pre-game out of game and in game pre-game would be anything that the player sees before they're actually playing the game maybe there's a main menu that pops up that has new game load game options credits quit speaking of options you know that could have things for setting your the visual, uh, visual settings, audio settings, accessibility, um, any other options you've set for the game, uh, combat options. That Some of those you might want to set before the game starts. Others are set while you're playing the game. And I call those out-of-game menus because they're not things that are supposed to be handling stuff that are in-game, but it's stuff you go out of the game to do, like pausing, save game, and some options. This is where you need to be careful because you're going to have several options that once set apply to every game and other options that once set only apply to the game you're setting them at. So if you're at the pre-game menu and you go to set options, if you set game difficulty, that just means by default games will be this difficulty when you start any new game. But if you actually start a game and change the difficulty, you probably mean I just want to set the difficulty of that particular game. So you have to decide all these things and say exactly what you mean here. Then there's all the in-game UX that has to be made. The HUD, the uh, character screen. Is it? And if it's if it's different for level up, you need a level up screen. You need an inventory screen. You need a journal for quests and rumors and notes. You need a dialogue U UX. You need looting and bartering and pickpocketing and using local maps and world maps. A sleep wait UX will probably be needed. And you need something just basically for messages. Hey, the player's taken damage. Hey, the player has fallen down. Hey, the player ha is now on fire. Those have to be displayed somewhere. So you have all of that stuff to go through. Now, while doing this, here's a couple considerations you may want to keep in mind. These are either their own sections or they're part of the sections I just described. And I've got three of these. The first one is PC versus NPC. Sometimes you write things like attributes or skills and everybody's got them. PC, NPC, and they work the same. But frequently it, they don't work the same. And I'll give you an example. You may have a melee skill that says when it's really high, you can knock out the opponent if you hit them. Or maybe you have a call shot saying if you hit a with a bludgeoning attack to someone's head, you have a chance to knock them out. That's super fun for a PC to do to an NPC, but it's really not fun for player characters to get knocked out. So you probably will say knockout cannot be applied to a player character. Similarly, you may not have flying for the player. You may want him to always be ground-based, but you may have some NPCs that fly. You may have bats that attack. You may have a dragon that flies in and lands and attacks. That's okay because NPCs can fly and you can control when and where they fly. You won't have a dragon try to go into a house and fly. If you let players fly, that's the first thing they're going to try to do. Similarly, you have to t think if you have multiplayer, because once you have multiplayer, some game features may disappear. For example, you may not want turn-based combat in your multiplayer game. So if you provide both modes, you're probably not going to allow that in multiplayer. Similarly, you may let people make their own character for the single player game, but in a multiplayer game, either they're handed a character or they go in, into someone else's campaign 
single player campaign and they take over one of the companions. So they don't get to make a character in multiplayer. Or maybe they do. And everybody has to make a character from scratch and start a new game every time. That's up to you. Something that I've put in my more recent um, design specifications is a section called fallbacks or design fallbacks. And this is a, a place where you put simpler designs that can be used in place of other designs that are in there in case you either run out of time or it turns out they're not working well or for whatever reason, you just need to fall back. I did this in Outer Worlds where there were several things that we said, oh, we couldn't get this working. Here's the fallback. Um, one of them was grenades. I wanted throwing grenades in the base game, but we really couldn't get the arcs working right. So we fell back and I believe we ended up with a, I think we had some kind of grenade launcher. I don't remember, but we ended up taking out the handheld grenades, which by the side effect took out a throwing skill that was in melee. It, there was unarmed, which includes throwing. So unarmed rolled into melee, and we got her throwing. Remember, the reason you often want these fallbacks is you often just can't delete something from the game and have no effect on anything else. Deleting grenades got rid of a skill. So some of it had to be rolled into other things. So I highly recommend doing that. Just to give you an example, this is the Arcanum design specification printed out. It's 148 pages. So we have a digital version of this. I don't think I'm allowed to put it out though. Technically, it's still covered under the NDA, but so I won't be posting it. But I can tell you, this was back when Arcanum was codenamed Epic, which is also what we called our post-apocalyptic for, potential fourth game. So it's very confusing in my files. It's 148 pages. There's a surprisingly lot of stuff in here that's very similar to what we shipped. I mean, this happened before any publisher even was interested in the game. And if you open it up, there's, um, let me see if I can show you this. There's a map, which looks a lot like the map we shipped on that was in the world map and was on the cloth map. So I was like, hey, that's pretty impressive. So it's also incomplete. There's a lot of user interface design that's missing at the end. We have them listed, but it says loot table, TBD. Um, we used this design doc to get a contract. And then after we got the contract with Sierra, they told us we had 90 days to make a prototype to keep the contract. So we had to take a subset of this design specification and say, this is what we have implemented after 90 days. It was, of course, a very small subset, but it was enough for them to see this is what the game is going to look like and play like when it ships. Whew, that was a lot of stuff. Oh my goodness, I talked a long time. Okay, I think in general, that is all of the design specifications you might need to specify one game. In this particular case, a fantasy role-playing game. So Gypsum Generation, I hope this answers your question.